Hey guys, in this episode, we are going to be comparing these two awesome camera bodies and we're gonna be deciding which one we're gonna keep and which one we're gonna sell. And we're gonna do it with the help of these guys. As you may know, I've really loved learning videography with the GH5. It's been excellent as both a vlogging tool and a tool to help me to expand my videography tool set. But since we shoot almost exclusively Fuji for our photography, um, it makes a lot of sense for us to reduce the size of our kit by moving to all Fuji. So I'm excited to see if the X-H1 can replace the GH5 for our needs. On the other hand, I'm pretty suspicious of this newcomer. It's a lot bigger than I'd hoped it would be. It doesn't shoot in 4K 60p, and it doesn't have a flippy outy screen. But maybe some of those complaints can be made up for with excellent autofocus capabilities and image quality, and that's what we're here to find out. So that's a little background into why we're doing this. We're not claiming to be the foremost experts on videography by any stretch of the imagination. We're certainly amateur or enthusiast videographers, and we're also bringing to the table a lot of our own biases. With that in mind, the, the first part of this video is just going to be a lot of footage, a lot of comparison without a whole lot of analysis. I'll save my own judgment and my own analysis to part two. And, that may or may not be interesting to you. Realizing that what's going to be best for us may not be what's best for you. And in spite of that, we sincerely hope that this video comparison will be of some use to you, or at very least, you'll find it entertaining. In this video, we wanted to shoot something real and something exciting, none of these boring lab tests or selfie autofocus tests. To that end, we invited our friends from the band Kuma back, who many of you will remember that Danae and I met hiking last month in one of our photo duel videos. With their help, we're going to try to make a music video using these two cameras. We'll be getting just about every type of shot we can, either handheld using the glide cam or on a slider or tripod. For the actual footage that we're going to use for the final music videos, we're going to be shooting in profiles. For the GH5, we're going to be using Cine D, and for the X-H1, we're going to be using the new Eterna profile. Okay, well that pretty much sums up our plan. When we're done, we should have two separate videos, one from each camera that are identical, if not just extremely similar, um, for you to enjoy and to help you make your own decision. So let's stop talking and let's start shooting. To be able to compare nearly identical footage, we mounted the two cameras together on this long Arca Swiss plate, and we'll be recording everything simultaneously. We also picked three sets of lenses with similar focal lengths and apertures to try to get footage that matches as closely as possible. We decided to shoot this music video in 25p for reasons you'll see later during the autofocus test. The X-H1 was shot in 8-bit 4K and the GH5 was shot in 10-bit 4K. This is going to be the wide fallback shot. It has two purposes. The first one is to ease the band into being filmed and the second one is to use the footage as a last resort if none of the other angles work out. Here's some side-by-side -side footage straight out of camera. Once with the camera just sitting there unmoving on the tripod. The next will pan back and forth with the slider. We aren't risk takers and these shots will make absolutely sure we have at least something for the whole video. These shots are manual focus with 24mm equivalent lenses on each camera. While we can't compare every camera profile and we aren't willing to film and log, Cine-D represents a pretty standard profile and many have compared it to Eterna, which is why we've chosen these two profiles. All footage was daylight balanced. Now keep in mind that when we shot this whole music video, we were pressed for time. We shot the whole thing in less than two hours, and that includes the behind the scene footage for this episode. That was a lot to try to cram in and mistakes were bound to be made. One of these was that for many of the GH5 shots, we were a bit overexposed. But even with the shots which were perfectly exposed, we noticed a lot more yellow out of the GH5 and that Cine D profile, it seemed to push a lot further into the yellow end of things. Be sure to subscribe if you're interested in color as we will be doing a more in-depth comparison at a later time. I'm just balancing the gimbal. The gimbal shots are what's going to make up the majority of the shooting and of the of the angles we get. So this includes establishing shots, this includes up close kind of hovering around the musician shots. We're going to stick with manual focus on these lenses. We've got the Rokinon 16 and the Fuji 16 millimeter manually focused. Um, yeah. Keep in mind that neither of the lenses being used in these shots have image stabilization. This next shot, we're gonna do some tight shots on the instruments, and um, we're gonna use some narrow lenses for this. I'm using the Rokinon 85 and the Fuji 50 to 140, and I'm gonna test focus pulling. So we're just gonna test that out and see how it goes. 
Focus by wire can be extremely annoying on those small mirrorless camera lenses. Pulling focus can be haphazard with inconsistent focus speeds and distances and extremely long throws, which is why we switched to shooting with primarily Rokinon lenses on the GH5, as they were so much more ideal for manual focusing. But with the X-H1, Fuji has given us a new setting for linear focus pulling. This is a great start, and even with this huge lens, I felt like the focus throw was manageable. I'd love to see Fuji take this to the next level in a firmware update and allow us to fine tune the focus speed also. When it comes to high speed frame rates, we decided to incorporate the 2x speed slow motion effect. For this we had Barry of Kuma play a riff at double speed and the rest of the band jump on the couch behind. I'm not sure what this shows as far as camera comparisons go, but it was fun to shoot. Of course both of these cameras can go much higher than 2x. Since I didn't test this with a band, here's some shots of my dog. The X-H1 can be shot at a high speed frame rate of 120 frames per second for some 20% speed action, while the GH5 has its variable frame rate setting which will allow it to go up to 180 frames per second or a quarter speed, also at the 1080p limitation. I'm going to do this handheld. So we're going to flip the cameras into autofocus continuous now for this next test. For me the biggest drawback of the X-H1 is that lack of fully articulating screen. But I could get past that if I knew I could turn that camera towards myself and not have to worry about the autofocus. And we're going to switch the GH5 into a mode that the internets have recently told us that we're supposed to be in if we're going to be using autofocus continuous. This includes shooting in PAL frequency so we can use 25p and also setting the shutter angle to 179. For the X-H1 we don't have time to test every autofocus setting. I'm sure there will be other videos on this. I've had the best results by cranking up the tracking sensitivity and the autofocus speed all the way up. But I didn't know that when we were doing this music video, so my settings were zero on the tracking sensitivity and plus five on autofocus speed. But that seemed to work just great. Also note the stabilization. Both in-body and in-lens stabilization are enabled for both cameras for this test and everything is handheld. Well, that's a wrap. I hope you guys enjoyed watching us film this real world comparison. It was a lot of fun to shoot. Um, so hopefully it can help you. I know it'll help us. Stick around for our conclusion. If you're interested in that, we'll meet you back in the studio. For those who are not, I encourage you to go watch the music video that came as a result. You can check out the GH5 one or the XH1 one, and uh, you can draw your own conclusions on which one uh, did a better job. We'd love to hear your comments on what you think. Uh, but for everyone else, we'll meet you back in the studio for some of our own analysis. Based on the number of comments we get from folks about which camera to buy nearly daily, we know that picking a camera can be really hard, especially when you don't have both cameras in front of you to make the decision. And that's compounded by the irrational and emotional response to things that are a little bit less tangible, things like the brand or uh, our emotional response to the brand and how it feels when it's in our hands and even like the draw or the, the desire to have that nice new shiny thing. All of those can seriously screw with our ability to make a good decision or what we consider a rational decision when we're considering these cameras. And so with that in mind, I just don't trust myself. I really don't want to, to rely on my own irrational mind to make an important decision that involves potentially thousands of dollars. So when I need to make a decision like that, I always turn to the logical, emotionless, artificial intelligence. For these decisions, I use helpmydecision.com. It uses a split decision algorithm to help to prioritize all factors of a tough decision independent of one another. It helps me put my bias into perspective and be impartial with factors that demand impartiality. I do think it's important to mention that I think it's okay to have biases, right? It's okay to have emotional responses to things. If we love a piece of gear, the chances are that we're going to use it more often. And if, and if it inspires creativity in us, well, that's great. That's what the whole point of this is, right? To be creative. So I don't think we should just shelve the emotional response, but it is important to keep it in perspective and not let our emotions just overweight other important factors. So here's a quick scan of the factors that I consider important um, and how important each one is. The next step we're going to go through together so you can get a peek into my analysis. 
Size and weight is one of the most important factors to me. We are run and gun to the extreme, and I like to be able to stick small cameras and small lenses into small bags and just go. But these cameras are extremely similar. The GH5 weighs 60 grams more than the X-H1 and is a little bit wider. I call it a wash, and I won't bother factoring it into the equation. The next factor I'll be considering that is pretty huge for us is 4K 60p. We love slowing down footage. We love 4K, 60p, beautiful footage slowed down to 30p um, to get just a little bit of slow-mo. And the X-H1 just doesn't have it. And to us, that was a pretty big disappointment when we learned the X-H1 wouldn't be shipped with that. Now, some have argued or said that maybe Fuji will give us a firmware update with that. That would be great. I think that would be awesome, but it's not something I'm counting on at this point. So with that in mind, we've got to give uh, a 10 to the GH5 and a zero to the X-H1. As far as image quality goes, there's only really two factors that I'll be comparing. One is low light and the other is color. When it comes to color, obviously our music video is not enough to really show the camera science behind these two camera manufacturers. I am working on another video which will more directly compare those, so I'd encourage you to subscribe so you don't miss that. With the GH5, we've always shot in Vlog or Cine D and that's always been fine. Um, but now that I've seen that Eterna profile, I realized just how much I didn't really enjoy the Cine D profile. That Eterna profile is just beautiful. It's great for grading. It's a great place to start, especially where I'm not a colorist and, and Vlog was a lot of work sometimes. Not only that, but would introduce more noise than I wanted to when shot in lower light. But man, that Eterna profile, when I brought that into DaVinci Resolve and started messing with that, it felt like when I was using Lightroom for the first time with some still photography, it just, it felt like that. It felt that good. It was just wonderful. And, and I really liked it. Of course, everyone's gonna have a different opinion on this. I'm not a colorist and please uh, take my analysis here with uh, at least two grains of salt. So for this, I am going to give the X-H1 a 10 and we're going to give the GH5 a seven. For low light, maybe this goes without saying, but the X-H1 easily outperforms the GH5 with that bigger and more highly performant X-Trans sensor. While low light isn't the most important factor for us, uh, I do care a little bit about it. So for this, I'm gonna give a three to the GH5 and an eight to the X-H1. Super scientific, not really. When it comes to lenses, the Micro Four Thirds platform really shines. You have like a bajillion options for adapting lenses, but not only that, but just a lot of different manufacturers using that platform. Obviously the Fuji X platform for lenses is a lot smaller. There's a lot less variety. So if you're really into lenses, there's a good chance you'll find a lens that you love on the Micro Four Thirds platform. But for me, I love the Fuji lenses. That's why we shoot Fuji because those lenses are so small and yet so beautiful. But when you start shooting video with those Fuji lenses, you learn really quick that that's not what they were designed for. They're obviously designed for stills photography. And unless you want to fork out some major dollars for the high-end Fuji video lenses that have come out recently, then you're kind of stuck with these photography lenses. Uh, if you do both, maybe that's not bad, but if you only do video, that will be a drawback. Reason number one is that the OIS on some of these lenses is really loud. You get a hiss when it's on and that can creep into your audio depending on what you're shooting. For us, it certainly does with the shotgun mic on top of the camera. We do get a little bit of hiss in the, in the audio and that's not ideal. Additionally, some of the lenses, like my favorite lens, the 16 millimeter 1.4 is really loud when it's being focused. Same thing, you get that in footage when you've got a, a mic on the camera. A lot of people will say, oh, don't put the mic on the camera. And yeah, sure, that's fine, that works for a lot of people, but for vloggers, that doesn't work to just say that. So if that, that may not be a problem for you. For us, it's a little bit of a problem. So for my own personal score, when it comes to lenses though, um, it's kind of a wash, right? The, the Micro Four Thirds platform, like I said, is, is great. There's a lot of options there. I still, my heart is with the Fuji lenses, but they're loud. And so to me, this is a little bit of a wash. I'm just gonna give them both of a five. Maybe I even shouldn't even have that factor in here, but I felt like it was worth talking about. Next is image stabilization. Again, I'm gonna be doing a bigger, more thorough, in-depth testing of comparing these two camera bodies in various image stabilization circumstances. Um, I've already done some of those, but to me, the image stabilization in the X-H1 is edging out the GH5. Again, that's a tentative because I haven't really tested enough, but for me in this music video, you see a little bit more shake on that GH5. So the, the X-H1 is gonna edge it out just a little bit. So I'm gonna give the GH5 an eight, the X-H1 a 10, and that's what we've got for image stabilization. This next 
categories, that's a little different. This, uh, this is a strange name I know, but then this is very specific to us, but it's the category of autofocus continuous versus flip screen. As I mentioned previously, it's acceptable to me to not have a flip screen if I can rely on that autofocus completely when I'm pointed at myself and when I'm bringing products up and things like that. Now, the X-H1 passes that test with flying colors. It performs super well. It always finds my face and it just locks on there. It did in, our, in, the, in, in the music video, it did a great job. And I've seen other examples where when something's close to something else and you're moving focus, it's super smooth. Uh, it's just great, it does a good job. Where it doesn't do a great job is when you're moving to, from something up close to something far away. Uh, for whatever reason, it really struggles to focus on background when it's moving away from the tight subject. And that, um, does, it doesn't matter really what sensitivity you use, it just struggles there. Uh, fortunately for us, that's not that big of a deal. If I'm using autofocus, it's because it's focused on my face. Otherwise, I'm just gonna be manually focused in video. So, uh, it's a little bit of a wash. I could go either way. I don't really need a flip screen in this case. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say a five either way. Again, I only have it here just so you, so I could discuss that with you. Next is dynamic range. Um, the X-H1 gives you a 400% dynamic range option. And I don't know a ton about this yet. I haven't played with it enough. I, I just think it's kind of cool. I have seen footage with it, it looks beautiful. Uh, my own footage, I've only done a teeny bit, so I don't yet know the capabilities here, but it has it and the GH5 doesn't. So, you know, it's a small factor, but, I, but I'm, putting it in here, Dyna uh, dynamic range gets uh, zero for the GH5, 10 for the X-H1. Okay, so next let's talk about hybrid shooting. Now, the X-H1 has an H in it because it's supposed to be hybrid, but if it's hybrid, why, Fuji? Why did you make it such a pain to switch between stills and video when you knew we would be doing that as a, with a hybrid device? Some of us very often. Um, it's a pain. It's just a pain. I mean, if I'm if I'm in stills and I want to get to video, I have to potentially change four different settings. One, I've got to flip the drive mode dial, and it's not just a quick flick. I have to move it all the way from from the camera to the S. And then two, I'm gonna to have to change my shutter speed almost every single time. Sometimes I have to use two dials, like in this case where I was shooting a 25P for that music video, I needed to be in shutter speed of a 50. To get there, I needed to manipulate a second dial. And so that was two steps. So now we're on three steps. And then after that, usually I need to compensate by changing the aperture. So that's four steps to move from video to still, especially when we know Fuji has the ability to store settings. And I know that because the X-A3, for instance, has a drive mode button. And in the X-H1, we have a, a silent movie mode where almost every setting can be manipulated by touch on the touch screen. And we, don't, we just ignore the dials. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the dials. I love the ergonomics. I love the way that it feels to use those when I'm shooting in video or still separately. What I don't love is moving between them and having to manipulate all those dials. So, Fuji, your next firmware upgrade. Please, please give us a way to store our, our video or photo mode so we can just toggle between them without having to touch a dial. That would just save so much time. So with that in mind, I'm gonna give a five to Fuji and the X-H1 and the GH5 gets a 10. All right, so next let's talk about battery capacity. You will burn through batteries with the X-H1 unless you plan to use the grip, which I would never do. For me, this camera is already bigger than I want it to be. Why would I make it bigger? But when it comes to the battery, those Fuji batteries, they just you just go through them so fast. Um, it's not really a question of if you're gonna have battery problems that will affect your shoot, it's when. It will happen, um, and so, uh, that's a big con here. But the GH5, on the other hand, it's more like a DSLR in that battery capacity. I would go so far to say it scores about an eight if a DSLR was a 10. Whereas that X-H1, it's pretty dismal. I'm just gonna give it a one. Next, we have auto exposure. I don't really use auto exposure, but if you do, it's important to note that um, X-H1 is gonna give you this clicky iris when you move from shadow to light. Um, you'll, you'll see it kind of move to, um, to compensate for the exposure and it's distracting. GH5 is smooth. So 
small factor, but worth considering. Um, XH1 gets a three, GH5 gets a 10. Finally, last on my list is high speed frame rate. Now, to me, um, I'm, I'm fine with 120 frames per second. 180, uh, I've used it before and I almost always end up pushing it a little bit, speeding it up in Premiere anyway. Um, it's nice to have that little extra in case you want it, but uh, not, not vital. Either way, GH5 gets a 10 because it edges out the XH1 just a little bit. XH1, I'm gonna give it a seven. So lastly, let's talk about our emotions. Let's talk about our feelings because as I mentioned, I don't think it's, we should just completely discount or not consider how our emotional response is. You've probably felt some emotional response to me going through this. At some point, I probably said something that you didn't like hearing about a, a brand that you enjoy. Use that as uh, insight into how you feel about these cameras and, and put it in here as, as a factor. Just make sure it doesn't outweigh some of these other considerations for yourself. For me, um, I had an emotional response to that XH1, I'm not gonna lie. At first, I didn't think I'd like it. Uh, if you follow the channel, you know that I wasn't even going to get it. Um, I decided to mostly because I wanted to review it, but it's grown on me. We really enjoyed using it for the music video and I like the footage that came out of it better and that surprised me. Um, I enjoyed Eterna. I enjoyed the way the camera felt in my hand. That's not a surprise. I will admit I do kind of like Fuji and I like the experience of shooting with Fuji better. In, in general, it's a better experience than the GH5 except for the hybrid shooting component that I already mentioned. But maybe I'm also a victim of the shiny new thing syndrome at this point. Um, either way, I think I would be sadder emotionally to lose the X-H1 to sell it. So for me, I'm, I'm more excited about the X-H1 at this point emotionally. I am going to give it a 10. I still love the GH5 though. It's still an excellent camera. It's just, uh, Comparatively speaking, I'm not as emotionally invested at this point, so I'll probably give it a six, I guess. All right, so here we go. As I said to begin with, um, I don't know what's on the other side of this page. It'll be a surprise to me as much as it is to you. And I swear to you that whatever the result is, that's what I'm gonna follow. I'm not gonna trust my own irrationality. So I'm gonna agree to these terms of services and enough talk, it's button pressing time. <laughs> I guess I have to have a one. Whew. That was totally anticlimactic. Let's try it again. GH5 wins it. Okay. Wow, and not even by a small number. That just shows you how unreliable or how just... Uh, you shouldn't make decisions just based alone on emotions because I, I mean, I would have been headed to the pawn shop already if I wasn't going through this exercise with the GH5 ready to, ready to sell it. But it's obviously the best choice for us at this point. So it's what we're going to keep. Um, I'm sure your results will be different. I'd love to hear what your results are, by the way, in the comments and what you, what you find for yourself. But for us, GH5, it's, uh, it's what we're going to hang on to. And we're gonna try to find a new home for the X-H1. So if anyone's looking. All right, well, it's much later and uh, this has been a lot of work, but I, I think we're good to go. Um, I hope that you found it helpful. Um, either way, I think it was extremely beneficial for us and, and a lot of fun. I'd love to hear from you though, if you went through this full process, what camera did you decide works better for you? Um, let us know in the comments and also let us know why. I'd also like to thank my wife, Danae, for her help on this. And then also obviously Kuma, great band. I hope that you'll subscribe to all their social things. Um, you can find a link to their SoundCloud below. So until next time, we certainly will do something like this again very soon because now that we have a winner between these two camera bodies, it's on to the next contender, which of course is the A7R III. So that's it for now. I'll talk to you again real soon.